Well, now you put the three together, and what you have is I have a digital version of you that I can have a conversation with whenever I want. So imagine if you could have a conversation, a video chat, let's say, like a video conference with your grandfather, great-grandfather, whenever you wanted. And it would be exactly as real as he was. But well, we might not be able to do that because we don't have enough data on your grandfather, but we certainly have enough data on you. What that means is your grandkids will be able to have a conversation with you whenever they want. In that sense, you live forever. And that is immortality. Because in the experience of whoever is interacting with you, it's as real as it gets. Now, you might argue and say, yeah, but that's not really real. Which then begs the question, what is real? What does real exactly mean? How do you know I am real? How do you know everyone else is real? The only reason why you know that is because the way we are acting out, the way we are behaving, it fits your mental model of what real is. As long as our behavior matches that, it is real for you. That's how subjective experience works. Now combine that with robotics. So this is a, this is a little far-fetched, obviously. Let's say a couple of decades down the line, we have robots that can look and feel like us. Combine these models, the, the text-based models and the audio-based models with that robot, and now you exist in the physical space, and your grandkids can have a conversation with you whenever they want. I mean, this is assuming they want to have a conversation with you, you know, which, well, we won't go there. But the point is that once we get to that point, we have achieved immortality. Now, some of you might still not be convinced that, yeah, but this digital immortality isn't real immortality. There is a difference. So for that, let's talk about biological immortality.